Hi, Mage fans. This is Terry Robinson with Mage the Podcast. And my guest today is distinguished cult author S. Rune Emerson. And Rune and I are going to discuss the Mage Tarot, the role of tarot, how to use tarot in your game, possibly culinary applications of tarot root, and a number of other things. Mr. Rune, how you doing? A little better now that you mentioned my culinary expertise. Yes. So what? So noted author, what book did you uh, produce, and can you share it with our audience? I can. I wrote a book called Nothing But a Pack of Cards, and it's a book on tarot sorcery, which is oddly apt considering I'm on a mage paradigm kind of like podcast right now. Let's do some uh, basics on the Mage Tarot deck. So this was produced in 1995, and you can get this on the Storyteller Vault slash DriveThruRPG slash Cards for yes. free. It's made available for free. It's used by authors in community published designs. One of my favorite things is if you get the one from DriveThruRPG, due to a typographic error, one of the roles indicated in creating the tarot deck is the rare position of Phil Bricato editor. So I, th- I thought, oh Phil, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like someone needs to someone needs to deal with Satoros. This came at a time in Mage history where it's like, oh shit, people are playing this. Like Second Edition had just come out or was about to come out, and it right. makes some interesting departures from a traditional tarot deck, which we'll discuss. And one yes. of the things thematically that's kind of important is the Major Arcana was done by Joshua Gabriel Timbrook, meaning that all the characters in the Major Arcana are tragically thin and attractive and slightly androgynous, and you're still afraid to talk to them after a night of raving. The other four suits are each done by a different artist. Colorists were Lawrence Schnelli and Joshua Gabriel Timbrook, and the book itself includes, in addition to uh, artist dedication and author dedication, a brief introduction on the history of tarot, some readings that you can do, correspondences, lowercase c, between each suit and each faction in the Incension War, and Mm -hmm. as well as some recommendations for how to use this in a chronicle, and finally, what literally every card depicts and its meaning. It's pretty neat because it contains a fair bit of mage lore baked into it, and some of it makes no effing sense. Like, the Four of Patterns has Void Engineer Ambrose Channing on it, and he kind of looks like Metron from DC Continuity, just kind of sitting there in a catbird seat, seemingly taking a dump on the Tellurian, which if I were a Void Engineer, I would totally do. Now, you had mentioned that there are some pretty odd appearances that pop up within this deck. What were some of the, the high points where you're like, oh, that's interesting that that's in here? So I love this deck, first of all. This was one of the first tarot decks I actually ever owned. And I noticed some inconsistencies after I had been really immersed in the lore for a few, well, for about a decade. And one of the ones that popped out that was really kind of apt on like the Queen of Primordialism, that's the Barabi card. Okay. And the character is Jody Blake, which is entirely appropriate. That's excellent. She gets one of the greatest appellations in all of Mage, where in the Ascension book, uh, she is described as Skankass, which I appreciate. <laughs> and I would like more DTF titles to occur among the Mage characters. But yeah. You know, my favorite title for her is Kevin Andrew Murphy's Bimbo Yaga. I just love it. I'm like... <laughs> I'm well documented as being an entire fan of all of the Penny Dreadful appearances like ever. And Jody figures into both the stories that come out of Truth Until Paradox and the actual like side uh, novel for Penny Dreadful. And so just Jody is such an excellent antagonist. I love her. <laughs> that, that I can certainly appreciate. My I started reading Truth Until Paradox, but I made the mistake of doing that after I had literally read every mage book except for like three that had Ooh. been released up until that time. And I'm like, this is not mage. So like out of self-preservation, I couldn't yeah. read it. it. It's like finding your parents' love letters. Oh, where no. you're, like, you're like, I don't want to be exposed to this. I understand that this was beautiful and torrid and appreciated in its time. But for me now... <laughs> No go. And the Seven of Patterns is Chain, one of the favorite characters from the Progenitor book. The Five of Pattern has the Matriarch from Mecca on it. And I think my favorite of the ones in the Major Arcana, uh, one, uh, Raging Eagle, Primus of the Akashic Brotherhood, is on the Justice card. And the other one that struck me was the Emperor is Chiron Mustai, the uh, founder of the Jassassins. Probably my favorite nickname among any of it. And the weird thing is, immediately next to it is the card, the Hierophant, which depicts 
a celestial chorus person who is obviously a Primus, but they're like, no, take that, Madam Bantu. You don't get a right. card. You don't get a name. You don't get an appearance. Exactly. You're not appearing in this film. Yes. You get two <laughs> fingers and a wand. And like the high priestess is May Roberts because his morning glade is already taken. But yeah. Yes. And, and my final comment regarding them is when I saw the card, the chariot, which depicts very <laughs> obviously either a marauder or a son of ether. And yes. for certain values of magic, you cannot tell the difference. That's true. Above a city on a ether ship with a wand aloft, ready to rain down peace and tranquility on the <laughs> earth. Is it Zarvargo? No, it is Jet Boy, who it's you Jet will remember Boy. from literally nothing else nothing, because I know yeah. no other references of Jet Boy. Jet um, Boy. I don't like I don't know. I just looked at that particular one and was like, sure, that's his name. I hope that is Zarvargo's like Wu Tang name or something like that. And he drops <laughs> He, he left to the ether. He's like, my first plan did not work. So now I will drop fat beats beyond the wall of the Umbra. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. You know, like one of the weirdest ones that I noticed in this, in the Temperance card, the character depicted is Salat. Who is Salat? Salat is the, the source of the Salubri from Vampire. The Antediluvian? Yeah, the Antediluvian from Vampire, who was ganked and eaten by the Tremere. <laughs> The founder of the Tremere clan in Vampire ate him in order to become a vampire. And that didn't turn out well in the grand scheme of things. No! But But I'm over here, like, I was looking at the deck and I'm just kind of going, well, that was an interesting choice. I like to think that the card, the sun, which depicts a naked child running around with like a wizard hat and a mace with the sun looking down on them, is a very early Porthos Fitz Empress. You know, for all we know, it could be a current Porthos. That would be great. Yeah, that's what happens when quiet gets too far. So can we talk a little bit about what tarot is and maybe where it came from? Yes, absolutely. Well, okay, so first answer, where did tarot come from? Nobody frickin' knows. And that is very frustrating. We do know a few things. In terms of history, we know that in 1375-ish, 1376, around that time from the Middle East, we acquired playing cards. These playing cards were, I mean, they were used for gambling, but they were designed with sayings from the Quran and kind of interesting little depictions on them that had nothing to do, of course, with anything anthropomorphic, because that's against their religion and has been for a very long time. But so they were designed for gambling, but they were also sort of designed for like meditation. We have those. We know we have those. Those were obviously not tarot cards. Then you have, in 1440, we have the Duke of Milan, who we have a document that that is a request that he made, like a, a letter that he sent out, requesting triumph cards for a festival. And it's interesting because the festival being referenced here is the progression of triumphs. It's this parade as part of a festival period wherein people dressed up as figures that would later become part of what we know as the tarot and kind of paraded through the town kind of showing the game of life and the parade was never in the same order like they didn't have like a a precise order like the deck actually does now and so it's very interesting because that's probably the first time anyone ever referred to them as triumph cards which is actually the more appropriate term for the major arcana triumph is a more appropriate term than tarot tarot is just the name of the game that they played Hmm, okay now the tarot deck was created kind of as a a hodgepodge where they combined these triumph cards the triumphi and the other playing cards that had evolved into what we now know as a poker deck and the poker deck actually has its own like separate thread of evolution as well but they did kind of come together long enough to create the game of Taroki, which is what is played in Italy. It's a trick-taking game. So the names and so on and so forth, like in French, it was Taro, which is what we use now. Taro or Taro. In Italy, it was Taroko or Taroki. The Eastern European is Taro. And those are basically all terms for the game that you played. There's no mystical associations, aside from the fact that you had cards like the Pope and the Papes a.k.a. the High Priestess Now, which was a very entertaining kind of innovation in the late 1800s, early 1900s. It's kind of a conceit, actually. But anyway, so the Pope and the Papes, they had references to the devil, and they had references to various virtues like strength and prudence, or temperance, as we now know. So they had references to Catholicism and medieval 
because it's supposed to be the game of life, and so it's sort of a caricature of life. So that's what we have. And it didn't all get settled down until the 1500s. That's when the tarot deck was, as close as we can tell, what we are starting to experience now in the earliest decks. For example, the Marseille tarot, the Visconti Sforza, they are originating from that particular period of time. Did those draws or those outlays draw from anything, or were those just novel inventions as of the time? Oh, um, what do you mean by draw? You have the arrangements of cards that where purported positions have associations after shuffling and drawing, possibly with a ritual of some sort. What is the term for that layout of cards? Oh, you mean the spread? Okay, the spread. Now, are those spreads from any other traditions or are those just novel inventions by Europeans at some point? Honestly speaking, I'm almost certain that the uh, the commonly employed spreads that we run into nowadays, the Celtic cross, the three card draw, all these kinds of things are relatively modern innovations because they happen in the 1700s. Okay. During the 1700s, there was a character named Antoine Court de Gebelin who was, he was very fond of saying everything magical kind of originated in ancient Egypt. Like there was a big movement. It was very in vogue to throw everything under the Egyptian bus. Hmm. And that's when the kind of the mysticism of the tarot got woven in. And of course it happened in France because there was a lot of divination and fortune telling going on out there. You run into that in the Lenormand decks and, and the Piquette and so on and so forth. Lots of fortune telling, lots of court stuff, lots of entertainment, parlor divination, and who's going to marry who, and what does this person think of me? And so the spreads and things kind of derived out of a need. They filled the gap. The Celtic cross is a very modern convention, and it is the most commonly employed spread amongst people who practice the tarot. And it is neither Celtic nor actually oriented with anything to do with Christianity or a cross. But anyway, so there's the ancient Egypt kind of angle where they're like, oh, the tarot is the secret book of Thoth. And it's all the ancient wisdom of the Egyptians. And you can read some of this stuff on the Book of the Dead. And actually, they started making, they started adding elements of that to tarot because it was an artistic convention to add mystical and occult elements to things for the symbolism. And it wasn't designed around, oh, I'm making something spooky. It's going to summon the devil. No, or, ooh, I'm, you know, creating something that is for fortune telling. It was just acknowledged that it was fortune telling. It's sort of like if you were to grab a poker deck that had, like, the, the figure cards were all ancient Egyptian characters, you know, Set and Anubis and Isis, because it's themed around that. They were, it's an artistic convention. So there is the story that the tarot are the secret book of Thoth and that they teach all the lessons of Egypt. And there's also simultaneously the idea that the tarot are somehow related to the Kabbalah, the Jewish mysticism and magical systems derived thereof, which are all appropriated and absolutely like, there's so much history behind all of this. All of the mystical stuff that you hear about that are associated with the tarot, their association with the Romani people, the travelers, and all of the fortune telling and curses and things that people would do and all this kind of stuff, like Roma curses and things, all of this stuff, it's all bunk. It was designed primarily to titillate in a time when people were very much uncertain about their future, uncertain about the state of their government and their nation, uncertain of their of their prospects and their happiness. It was stuff that they did in order to while away the time and make themselves feel more secure. And so it's very funny when people come up with these ancient, you know, woo-woo, this deck actually came from ancient Atlantis, blah, blah, blah. And because the thing is, it doesn't need any of that stuff to be useful for magic because we've obviously learned to use it for divination. Otherwise, people still be doing it. When this was being done, was it being done with like a wink and a nod? Or did the people who uh, read into the works of a, a, of a mystic think that it was actually from Atlantis or in, inspired by the Book of the Dead or by the Kabbalah or what have you? Historically speaking, and I say this with as much respect as I can for the old masters, most authors of occult of occult books were at least like 60% bullshit. Okay. They were bullshit artists. Try to remember that occultism by itself, like the study of the paranormal, the study of magic and so on and so forth, were illegal for a really long time. So like anybody who professes themselves to be a master of the occult arts from a certain period did very little in the way of historical 
betting. They didn't really keep bibliographies or references. And often when they needed something, they would just kind of bullshit it. And you can usually tell that stuff because it's stuff that validates the person's social status. Hmm. Like, oh, I picked this up from a witch in the old country. And she, her name was Magda. And she told me all of this stuff and da 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 And literally all of the things that you're reading are a bunch of hooey that validate the fact that this guy is an effete English scholar who was bored and tired of living in his little, like, manor house in fucking Coventry. That doesn't mean, and I want to be very clear about this, as a legitimate practitioner of the occult, this is actually my profession, this is what I do for a living. As someone who does this, there are sincere practitioners of magic, and there are references that are absolutely very helpful to those people who are interested in the metaphysical and the occult. And you have to be aware that a lot of those people were like old white racist men, or that they were being incredibly sexist, or that they believed that they were in some way superior to the people who they were writing about. Just look at how people have used the word and abused the word karma in the Western world today. I mean, that's not what that word means. That's not what any of that means. Uh, quick side lesson. Can you give a, a quick corrective or a recommendation on where to get a corrective on that? Sure. Okay. So the word karma is not anything about divine justice. It's not anything about, oh, well, you did this to me and now this bad thing happened to you. If the Hindus believed that, like, and we're talking like Indian culture right now, which by the way, I'm not Indian. So if I make any mistakes in this, I do apologize. Karma is paired with a concept called Dharma, the way it was explained to me by one of my friends from India. She said that karma is if you have a map in front of you, you are on a tour, Dharma is the landmarks that you were going to go to, and karma is the route you choose to get there. So what I would call the dichotomy between ethic and morals. Sure. Uh, what you want versus and as compared to how you get them. Right, exactly. Karma is if you take this route, you're going to need extra gas, and then you're going to end up having to like pay this off, and then you're probably going to have to sleep here, and then you're probably going to have to backtrack because that whole freeway is blocked or whatever. That's just a simple, mundane, modern kind of explanation of it. In terms of reincarnation th theory and the religious aspects and the caste system that the Indian people believe in, there's a whole bunch of of theological stuff that goes on to your karma. When you do bad things, when you do cruel things or selfish things, or you are myopic and you, you, you're short-sighted, when you behave in a manner that is less becoming of your caste, it sets your next incarnation back. And when you behave in a manner that is elevating you to the next caste, it helps you move up the progression into a new caste so that you can eventually escape the cycle of reincarnation and no longer come back. Get in there, Moksha. Right. Um. And so there's a whole bunch to do with this. And like, honestly, I am not an expert. I'm only like, I have a passing understanding. You kind of conveyed the idea that the Enlightenment is going on. We're losing the surety of the church. We're losing the surety of the nation state. We are starting to replace it with naturalism. People want something to kind of cling on to, yes. to have a sense of, let's say, destiny, that there is an order of things that is conscious and alive yes. that can be entreated. You've kind of mentioned phases. Is there a point where tarot stops being a gambling device? Or is is tarot or taroki still played out there somewhere? Oh, it's still played. It's okay. absolutely still played. Um, in fact, if you if you go into Europe, especially places like France, Portugal, Spain, India, or uh, Italy, you're going to encounter people who play it. It's not considered to be an ancient mystical art. There are people who are said to be able to do that. Like if you go to Europe, the point is the person, not the cards. The cards themselves are not mystical to anybody in the know anybody who knows a fortune teller. Here in America, we have a very interesting provinciality about our approach to the occult because we were so separated from the changes in the old world that we didn't understand a lot of the things, the like fads that were coming our way, but we decided we did. You know, we made our judgment calls and we made our decisions about all of this. And so when occultism managed to make its way into New England, usually, or over on the West Coast in San Francisco, just because those were major trade routes and those were places where people entered in and taught their stuff, we decided we knew what people were talking about because we don't like to sound ignorant. And so we just kind of made stuff up. So nowadays you have people who are terrified of tarot cards, terrified of Ouija boards, terrified of meditation and Buddhism. 
The terrors of Buddhism. I want to see like a 1950s style or like a 1920s style reefer madness on like right? <laughs> kids are doing what they call getting serene these days. And exactly. Focus, yeah. As much as I object on, on, in principle to Lululemon yoga pants, I don't see that they are a conduit of the devil or an open portal to the underworld or anything like that. And the same thing goes with Ouija boards, tarot cards or anything produced by Milton Bradley or Parker Brothers. It's just we like as human beings to romanticize and fetishize and make much of things. And the tarot have had a lot of this done, which is why they're so useful in Mage the Ascension, because like if they hadn't designed a deck by now, I would be out there trying to actively help them do that. Because it's relevant. It's perfect for what they're trying to do. I'm sorry. Just to check some basic things, if sure. I were to buy a Bible or a Quran and I mm. were to treat that poorly, practitioners of certain faiths would consider that to be an extreme affront. Or if I were to use like a Bible as part of an art project where I was going to like hollow it out and use it to to store a whiskey flask or something like Oof, that, or as yeah. part of a collage. Uh, sure. There's a non-trivial number of people who would be offended for, by that, which is fine. If I were to buy a tarot deck and use it as a as a pinochle deck or something like that or some modified yes. card game, does it have a similar status among a group? And if so, who? All of the people who make their like their their worldview about the occult, there are so many different kinds of ways to look at things, but all of them have their personal soapboxes they stand on. And a great many of them are taught. I actually teach a class on this whole thing, like debunking certain traditions and like myths and superstitions about tarot and divination and stuff like that. But there are enough of those that I could make an entire series of classes on it. There are people out there who, if you riffle your cards, they will scream. That's a thing. People have very strong opinions about what they consider sacred. And the tarot absolutely can be considered sacred. If I were to codify by my own faith practice, the tarot are absolutely part of it. I see the world through the tarot in the same way that Neo sees like strings of numbers. I, when I see two people getting together and making goo goo eyes at each other, I see the two of cups. But so, but I, what I'm saying for now is it is there. While there are people who would find having maybe a mage tarot or just absentmindedly uh, rifling it to be inappropriate, that would be on the more dogmatic end of yes. people who consider tarot as part of some sort of spiritual or uh, or mystical practice. Right. A great many people think of them as a psychological tool. They relate to Jungian philosophy and the concept of archetypes, and they think of the tarot as sort of a book of archetypes, like a little deck of archetypes. A great many other people look at them as religious tools associated with their faith. They might be Wiccan, or they might work with some sort of pantheon or practice that is associated with some of those myth structures that people believed ancient Egypt, Kabbalah, all this kind of stuff. These are still valid, even if they were not historically accurate, because they are practiced. You cannot tell me that there is a single religion in the world or spiritual practice that is entirely historically factual, because we've debunked so much of that and proved so much of that. And just because that may be a fact does not mean that the practice that they are following is any less sacred special or accurate to their purpose it certainly has layers to it that there, yeah. there's some sort of base truth and some sort of revealed or metaphorical or implied or um or allegorical truth to it so what are the suits then in tarot and what are the mage versions of those strictly speaking a tarot deck is 70 cards split up into a, okay this is the baseline all right some tarot decks have more cards some have less i don't know why they're even considered tarot, but whatever, it's fine. They have a split between the Major Arcana, also known as the Triumphs. The Major Arcana are the high concept cards. They're the, the, the lofty kinds of concepts, the mystical or the philosophical things about the world, love, death, transcendence, ecstasy, all this kind of stuff. And so those particular cards are 22 in number, give or take. And then the rest of the cards are material concerns to do with the world. And those are the Minor Arcana, split up amongst the ace through 10 or the two through 10. Um, those are pips. And then the court cards, which are the uh, page, knight, queen, king, or some variant princess, prince, king, queen, that kind of thing. And occasionally the ace is added into that as a court. It depends on which method you're working with. So 78 cards. Now the four suits of the minor arcana, they are divided into 40 and the 40 and 16 in that particular number setup. 
But each of the different suits has 10 cards that are numbered and then four court cards. And the suits are as follows. You have cups, you have swords, you have wands, and you have coins. And there are various variants of this. Coins are also pentacles or discs. Wands are also staves or sticks. Swords are, interestingly enough, they also all correspond to the playing cards. So like hearts are associated with cups and swords are associated with spades and so on and so forth. Wands, clubs, diamonds and coins. And that one's probably the easiest to identify diamonds and coins. They're both currency. But those are the basic setup for the minor arcana. In mage, the currency and the suits and so on and so forth are identified with the spheres. And that's one of my favorite parts of it. Um, by the way, I do want to make a quick reference for those of you who are owners of the original first edition deck. I know if you read the book, you will notice this if you pay close attention. But on page 12, they have this little like black and gray little grid separation there where they say, oh, this one is associated with the swords and this is associated with the cups and the wands and the pentacles. But they're not. They're incorrect. And you may have noticed that. So let's expand a little bit further. So as I was saying, so cups are associated with primordialism, which, as I said, were entropy and time. They are also associated with Nefandi, which I found to be interesting and sort of a, a validating principle. Anyways, so yes, questing is wands, and it's associated with the traditions. It's spirit and correspondences. Then you have dynamism, which is associated with wands, and that's mind and life, and that's associated with marauders. Then you have pattern, matter and forces, technocracy, and coins or pentacles, as they refer to in this deck. And this is a case where, again, it, we have said a lot of words out loud that correspond to various listings and symbols and so on. The Mage Tarot deck is available for free through Drive Through RPG, uh, Storyteller Vault, and any of the associated one bookshelf properties like that. You can also now get a print-on-demand deck, which ain't bad. It is really good from what I understand. I have two friends who have it. They like it. Yeah, for the, the 25 bucks it costs versus the much more than $25 I paid for my <laughs> my first edition Same. one like the last year. Um, this is actually the third copy of the first edition deck I own, or I, I, I now own because I've given them away over the years. Oh, that's nice of you. I am such a completist that I'm like, okay, I have the first edition Mage Tarot but I don't have the revised Mage Tower, despite the fact that the same damn cards. Yeah. I want that too. You know, and in the in the new print-on-demand deck, the little paper book that comes along with it is not nearly as cool as the one that came with the first edition. Yeah, we now have a correspondence between those, and those are all tied to essences. Like one of the, yes, one of the things the that- the Avatar essences. Yeah, that was introduced in first edition that was kind of dropped slowly over time is that you tie the Nefandi to Primordial, the traditions to questing, the marauders to dynamic, and the technocracy to pattern. And those kind of right. make sense. But at various times in the game, there is a mention that there is a fifth type, the infinite avatar. Infinite. They would be linked with the major arcana themselves, which that is something I always like to bring up whenever I talk to people about tarot decks. They don't have four suits. They have five. The fifth mm, suit is the is major arcana. arcana. And with that, can we talk about how to actually use the darn deck? Absolutely. So I would really like to, at some point, see them update the Mage the Ascension deck to include the new Disparate Crafts, like the different traditions. I would really love that because I think it would look really neat. Because when you're using it in-game, this actually kind of is the evolution of my position when I first kind of looked at that Salat appearance on the Temperance card. This is not a World of Darkness tarot, it's a Mage tarot, but the Mages live in the World of Darkness and they see the world. And so the things that they perceive, they jot down the way that they perceive them. So I have to assume that someone in world created this deck, like hmm. when I'm playing a game and someone's using it, or when I'm the one using it and I'm you know playing in a game. So let's, much like the Fragile Path, there this is something that could exist in world, and a character Correct. could be a cardomancer using the their Ascension deck or what have you, and be actually using it. So absolutely. Besides divination, how would it be used as a focus? Do you feel for a character? Okay, so as a cardomancer in game, there are so many effects. There are so many little actions that a person can do in order to use the cards. If you're playing like a fortune teller character and your focus centers around the concept of, of cardomancy, as in it's represented in in your instruments through through cards and maybe practices to do with those cards, there are so many things you can do with a deck of cards that work for spellcasting that don't even have to do with what card is pulled. For example, 
you shuffle the deck and that could be an action to create a particular kind of entropy effect. You could create like a hex around the environment. Well, I just shuffled the forces and now nobody knows what's right and what's wrong, what's up and what's down. Speaking of that, if you draw a card, drawing a card is almost always when you're working with the cards as spell casting methods. Drawing a card is to pull what they call a significator in the business. A significator is a card which represents a subject. Okay. Sometimes it represents a querent, the person asking a question of the diviner. Sometimes it represents an, a, like a subject that, that you're reading about. You know, I'm reading about this party I'm going to next week. This is the card that came up. It's the Six of Cups. Okay, so a bunch of people I know are already are going to be there, and it's going to be mostly like the old guard, that kind of thing. So you draw a card and, and signify a person by using that card, which allows you to do long distance magic, ritual magic, and things like that with your mage character. Or in line of sight, you can draw that card to represent them, just like holding up a voodoo doll of them. You can gesture with it and do things to them. You could draw the Ace of Swords and use it as a weapon to cut someone from far away. That kind of thing. These are vulgar effects, but... Depending on where you're at, it might actually be considered coincidental because of the way that the cards have become immersed in people's superstitions and their belief systems and so on and so forth. It depends. So there's a reality zone you feel where where otherwise vulgar effects involving the tarot deck are going to be much more acceptable. Yeah, and they're most likely going to be in one of two areas, culturally speaking. You're probably going to run into places in America where people are very superstitious about tarot cards and, and anything to do with the occult. It's We have, as I said, very provincial views on what constitutes something's deep mystical powers. And any place where someone might say to you, oh, I don't touch the tarot, they traffic with spirits, that's a place where you might find a reality zone. So either, a, a, either an occult area or... Or one that merely believes in the occult as a phenomenon Bingo. is going to see it as such. Okay, so I go to a temple, a, a tent revival meeting that's being led by a, uh, a very subtle nefondus. I can use the, the belief of the crowd <laughs> that these are tools of Satan to actually affect uh, change in the world. And hopefully no one present actually has true faith. Okay, following along. Then, like, if you go to Eastern Europe, there's a big tradition around the use of tarot cards for the purpose of witchcraft. And so you might run into a place, a reality zone out there. It's become a big thing in the last 20, 30 years. And that might be a place where you would run into some reality zone stuff. There are a lot of uh, Romanian fortune tellers, a lot of like Slavic fortune tellers who use the tarot as their, their primary method and sell their services and are considered quite intimidating. And people have made YouTube videos about it. And it's quite lovely, in my opinion. And that would be a good place to place a reality zone deep in the, you know, in, in the Black Forest. You've got this area where there's this group of women who live out there and don't let them get near you with their cards, that kind of thing. You could have a cardomancer go there and use their powers more freely. There are other methods you could use, like inverting the card. I love to do this one, actually, in games where I am using vulgar effects with a cardomancer. You invert the card on somebody. If you have a four ability and you invert the card, you could literally suspend them by the heel, sort of like Harry Potter style. Hmm. But more subtly, you could invert the card and whisper to it and insinuate a mind effect into them or an entropy effect into them and influence them that way. Because... The idea of inversion in, in tarot vernacular is the subject is inverted. They're, they're compromised somehow. So sometimes the card means it's, a, it's the bad version of the card. Sometimes an inverted card means it's the person is confused. There's lots of different things that you could turn that tradition into as a spell effect in your game. Can you give an example of a card and its reverse and what each means? Sure. Okay, let's use a court card because we were talking about people and everybody has trouble with court cards when they're learning to read the tarot. So this is a fun one to play with. So let's say you have a queen of swords. So you pull the queen of swords. In this deck, the queen of swords is actually the queen of dynamism. So the queen of dynamism has extra elements because we're associated with the actual game. But ordinarily, the queen of swords is someone who nurtures and advises in kind of an authority position with hard truth. She speaks with a sword, if you will. So she's got cutting words. Okay. And in the tarot, that represents Medea, the marauder oracle. Yes, in the uh, like in the Mage Tarot, that's Medea. However, when you invert that card, standard read of the Queen of Swords in the practice that I am familiar with is the Queen of Swords still nurtures people and tries to advise them using harsh wisdom, but she just comes across as a bitch and she doesn't know everything. 
that she thinks she knows, which is a common human experience. People who talk out their ass because they're used to being right. Hmm. Okay. Now, if you were to use that card as a spell effect, like a mind effect, say, you draw a card to represent a person, and it, it gender nonspecific at this point, you get the Queen of Swords for the person based on their role. We'll just assume that's the card you got. Anyway, so you pull that card out, you turn it upside down, and you whisper to it, and it compromises their judgment, causes them the inability to act efficiently, so they continue to act as if they have the authority they had, but their mind is not as clear, and they make mistakes. That would be a really easy way to mess with them using mind effects, or it would be a really easy hex to throw on someone using entropy. Okay, I'm picking up what you're putting down. So we have talked about the usage of the tarot deck in game. So these are all things that a player would use or a storyteller would use as a as a focus for an NPC. Is it uh, I think Loom of Fate walks through a uh, an actual tarot reading as part of the game. Is that something that you think a storyteller could reasonably do to start a session? Easily, I have done that before. I have a spread that I designed called the Master Spread, which I literally will visually lay out for people. I lay the cards out, and then I illustrate to people, oh, this is what's going on with that, and this is what's going on with this, as a storytelling mechanism that gets their car their characters motivated. And it also gives me some plot ideas. But there are even ways for you to do that in just spot divination. Like, if you're stuck as a, a storyteller, there are ways to turn the cards towards motivating plot either as an in-game experience or as just a a thing that you do outside maybe during downtime or when people aren't looking instead of throwing dice okay now again the uh there are other games that have similar randomization elements and the key to a lot of it is to just kind of bring up a a random element so the, the recommendations brought in the book are this is a way to lay out a practice to lay out a spell to figure out an npc to figure out a plot so if it's okay with you i'm going to shuffle my deck Go. And I am going to give you a, a slight setup in terms of where my characters are. Um, and you as a storyteller would say, hey, if I were to take these cards and draw it, this is kind of what the uh, the cards would be speaking to me. I am inverting the deck. Is it one of those things where roughly half the time a card should be reversed or inverted? Mathematically speaking, it's supposed to be like that. But okay. honestly speaking, eh. Okay, like, I didn't know if it's one of those things where like, oh, only one in seven cards should be reversed or something like no, that. There's no, there's no perfect ratio for okay, it. Okay, just checking. Let's pick an area. We have characters in a major urban city. They are mm-hmm. abroad. They do not speak the local language. They were supposed to have met up with a contact from a chantry mm-hmm. to help investigate something. Uh, there's something weird or amiss in the world. Let's say, uh, let's say they are somewhere in Eastern Europe. They are in Tallinn. I'm not sure the characters miss their connection. They don't have access to correspondence or mind. They're not sure what to do. I have drawn the, it's the eight of guy with his arms out reversed. <laughs> Hold on. It's the eight of guy with his arms out. I don't out. know. There's no, I, I don't see an obvious indicator of what. Okay. So what is suit. this the guy with the jet pack? Yes. Jet pack guy. Who is not jet boy. How is that not jet boy? Right. Okay. So I have drawn jet boy reversed. I have drawn the eight, eight of, um, what was that? The eight of. The, it's the eight of questing, AKA the eight of wands. Okay, so I have drawn the Eight of Wands reversed. As a yes. storyteller, that card comes in. How do you see that applying to the to the situation? Okay, this is actually a stupidly easy one. Well, like, show us how stupidly it. easy it is, S. Rune because Emerson. <laughs> the Eight of Wands has to do with flight. It okay. has to do with throwing all of your power towards something and flying towards your goal. And the card inverted and literally depicting Jet Boy with his jetpack, someone crash lands near them. Maybe the person is a marauder. Maybe the person is a scion of ether who's trying to get their stuff going together, and they just haven't been able to figure it out. But either way, betcha they're connected to some sort of chantry house or some sort of mage experience. They could at least make a contact. Okay, so some sort of uh, supernatural intervention with someone who has a somewhat fantastical view of reality. So the that sounds entirely reasonable. Now, the next one I'm going to do is sure. you have characters who are supposed to meet someone at a fancy pants high society dinner party. And they know that they are trying to meet up with someone who has information for them. But at the same time, there is someone else who's trying to get the information source first. Maybe it's mm-hmm. a turncoat. Maybe it's something like that. Maybe it's just someone who wants to foil your cabal's plan. And I'm going to draw two cards for that i got the empress Uh um right side up upright yeah and i got the six of marauders six of dynamism reversed there's a unicorn on a boat 
So if that doesn't tell you what you need to know. Yeah, that unicorn may have seen better days or possibly some sort of dwarf <laughs> unicorn, but I'm, I don't want to presume. Okay, so you got like someone depicted kind of rowing in Karin's boat across some water, and they've got a unicorn with them, and this is very much a marauder. And then you've got the Empress, and the Empress is, of course, Hesham Blade. And so we have, and she's kind of a really good card to be having if you're getting into a social situation. Ordinarily speaking, when I am drawing cards to kind of forward plot. I will draw a card that represents the characters, a card that represents any of the antagonists or plot elements that are already in the scene, and then a card that represents the outcome. Are they at the high society dinner yet? They're they're at the high society dinner. The card represents the role the person is playing, not necessarily their body, the person, okay. sex, or their identities, their actual identified gender. Um, it doesn't have to do with any of that. It just has to do with the person's role. Okay. Queen of all queens, the empress. So they run into someone who is a very powerful mage. They can tell she's freaking radiating. You know, they they put on their little peekaboo glasses and and do a perception awareness check, and she's radiating life magic. This is going to be an indicator to them. She informs them of something that they are supposed to go do. She radiates trustworthy authority. She is a a benign-looking character. She seems to have a clear understanding of things, and she doesn't have so much cloying friendliness that they immediately distrust her. But the problem is, once they start heading out, the pursuit that they are following starts to get hinky, and they're pretty sure they were sent on a wild goose chase, which means that was the enemy. Almost certainly the person they encountered intercepted them and stopped them. If they have done this divination, however, Mm -hmm. because I will allow my my diviner-based characters to do divination to find out how things are going to go, and I'll give them cryptic freak sauce answers about that by, you know, using the tarot or whatever their favorite thing is. If they have gotten this, they may have an indicator that though this person seems benign, their advice is going to lead you astray. I do like the term mystic freak sauce as a occult term of art. So I think I think I saw them at a uh, at a venue not too far from here in the early 2000s. So so how about we do one more? We've mm-hmm. done scenarios. Have you ever used the tarot to just guide character creation maybe? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, all right. So in those situations, you're going to need a couple of things. To get yourself started. You're just trying to generate a concept. If you're going with a mage, you're going to need a card for their avatar. You're going to need a card for their nature and a card for their demeanor. Otherwise, you're also okay. going to need those things. Okay. So, I have avatar, nature, and demeanor in front of me. All right. So what did you get? For the avatar, I got the Knight of Dynamism. So we've got a dynamic avatar. For sure. And the Knight of Dynamism, wasn't that kind of motorcycle? No, no, this is the dragon. This is the dragon, yes. He's burning some shit down. Yeah, I Okay, so what are the associations you then have with the Knight of Dynamism? Well, the Knight of Dynamism as an avatar, okay, we have a couple of options already. If the person is a mage, then maybe the awakening that they are experiencing is something mythic in origin. Their dynamism is about kind of seeing the mystical wonder in the world. Maybe they have an encounter with a bygone of some sort. Uh, Maybe their awakening starts because they watch someone animate the Chinese dragon tattoo on their back and it breathes flames. It could be a trigger event or it could be they just have this persistent concept of a dragon in their mind and it causes them to motivate towards the practice of magic and then they run into someone from House Flambeau in the Hermetics and that starts their awakening. Okay. So So, for nature, I have the, the Ten of Nefondi. The Cups. Okay, so I have a, a Ten of Cups for nature. What does that come out to? What, what is the Ten of Cups? This particular card is all about the dance with the devil, like the fulfilling of one's base desires. So this person is a hedonist okay. of some sort. Or a Let's celebrant go. or a bon vivant or... I would probably say that you're looking at someone who's bon vivant almost certainly as their nature. They really, or a sensualist actually, probably be better. Okay. Then for their demeanor, what did you get? I got a King of Dynamism inverted. And the King of Dynamism depicts a castle and there's a person thinking about things and there are ghosts and there are roses. Yes. And he's got a little butterfly on his hand. Yep. And he's just kind of sitting there kind of all crabby and all the things are are talking to him. Okay. So I would probably go with like visionary or benefactor because it's a king. We created our uh, our dynamic hermetic of House Flambeau, who likes the idea 
uh, that magic needs to be this intimate, sensual process. And he yes. believes that uh, he can bring about a better future by allowing people to embrace the uh, the agony and the ecstasy uh, of what he considers to be their inner divine, mystical, and hermetic practice. Indeed. We just banged out a character with a three-card draw. and we did. And this is a case where, sure, you can do this with other methods, but... I'm going to say it kind of looks badass if a storyteller is like, hey, I need a character and just starts drawing cards and starts telling a tale. And you're like, damn. Right. Do you ever use it as a full on way to generate a plot as opposed to, to something smaller? So this is where you guys get to find out my dirty little secret. Go on. So I cheat. When I'm running the story, I use the tarot as a as a regular kind of like story generator every time I'm getting together. If I'm confused or lazy or tired or whatever, I'm just, you know, I've had too much on my plate, but we've got a game tonight and I haven't done any preliminary work. I haven't done any research. Give me some spots to send them. Give me some people they need to talk to. Give me some, some challenges they have to encounter. I pull a card for all of that stuff. However, this is the, the dirty little secret part of it. I have been known to go into someone else's game when they are like storytelling and sit in the back with my cards and find out what the plot is before the storyteller has ever announced anything. And so I always seem to know what I'm doing and it upsets my storytellers to no end because they're not sure if I'm just really good at reading people and like their their movements or if I'm actually psychic. So are, are there any other uses that you'd like to recommend for the tarot uh, or that people should be, be aware about or um, maybe alternative sets of interpretations or, or, or further reading that you would recommend. Uh, sure. one, of the, one of the interesting ones that popped up in my homework was Anders Somberg had a game that uh, he or his group of players wrote called Genesis, which is entirely about uh, using the tarot deck to create an entire civilization and see how it plays out. I'll include a note to that in the show notes. Uh, once again, Bruce, that Anders Somberg has done more than I ever will. Any other uses? Okay, so to use the tarot deck for your game purposes, there are a couple of things that I do encourage people to do. Use the major arcana to create beliefs for a new paradigm if you're trying to create a new paradigm. Just pull three of them and look at them and go, okay, what do they have in common? Here, that's what this belief system is. Then innovate practices and or material components like tools, instruments, and so on and so forth based on the cards that you draw. One of my favorite tricks is I like to draw a single card from each of the four suits of the minor arcana, just the pips, not any court cards. And then I like to look at those cards and turn them into a practice. This is something that that mage does. What does it actually look like in practice? Like uh, we drew, what was one of the ones we drew already? The Eight of Wands, the guy with the jetpack. So he works on his own machines. He, you know, he makes his own stuff and then he tries them out and he's very fond of travel magic. Okay, I did it. I just pulled three cards from the Major Arcana. So what paradigm does Justice the Mage and Death Inverted give to you? That's like a Chakra Venti right there. It, yes, it, that one just kind of fell out the other side. Huh. So the idea of bringing balance and so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, wow, <laughs> that was really easy. That, that just kind of fell out the other end. So I'm going to say that seems to work. Okay, so, so that's one thing that I do encourage people to do. Another thing that I encourage people to do when doing their card reading, creating different kinds of spreads or something, I always encourage people to create spreads based on the kind of spell they want to do. As a storyteller, if someone is going to do a, a correspondence for effect, I draw four cards to see what kind of a spell it would look like if they're a cardomancer. Draw four cards. It's a four effect, four cards. That kind of stuff. These are really easy little things. Now, in terms of further reading, if you want to inspire yourself to people using cards in interesting magical ways that you can throw into your game, there's a book out there called The Game of Triumph. The, yeah, The Game of Triumph, I think is what it's called. I'm seeing stuff called The Game of Triumphs. Yeah, Game of Triumphs, that's right. It's a good novel to kind of inspire yourself. There's this weird game going on and people move through the tarot and that's a really way to bring in the umbra it's a great way to um they have an interesting crossing the ritual they have an interesting interaction they go into very specific pocket areas of the umbra it's all near umbra stuff and they experience the tarot card that is being thrown to them and they have to go through the challenge of it to win a, a play of the game to okay. win a trick it's very interesting cool kind of concept tim powers last call tim powers last call there's a game a poker game run every like 10 years or something on a boat out in Lake Mead in Vegas. And he uses a very specifically made tarot deck to run the game. And it's called Assumption. 
And yeah, you may win the hand and you may win the pot, but he takes all of the good things out of your life and assumes them for himself. Okay. It's well, really that's... neat. And it's like <laughs> so many entropy effects all over the place. And there are spirits watching over and you've like, it could be umbrewed that you're dealing with here. You could be oh, dealing okay. with like, oh, there's so much crazy stuff in that. These are some really good inspirations for running tarot concepts or tarot themes in your game. And if you're curious, Rune does post regularly on the Mage Facebook group with uh, things related to, to the sphere of activity. You can pose a question there. You could join us on our Discord, of which Rune is now a member. You could add him. Yeah, so if, you, if you're if you curious about implementation or follow-up, don't hesitate to contact us. There, there are resources out there. We'll get you in contact with the right people. Well, thank you so much for your time, Rune. Hey, no problem. You've been listening to Mage the Podcast. Find out more at magethepodcast.com. Follow us on Twitter at Mage the Podcast. We are also available on Anchor.fm, Spotify, and a number of other services. Join our Discord server. It's an absolute hoot. If you have any questions, feel free to dump it into the Mage the Ascension Facebook group. We try and get back to everyone who pokes uh, pokes at us. And with that, the Mage the Ascension non sequitur quote of the episode is, she surrenders completely to the lore of the unconscious. The realm of dreams becomes a nightmare. Drowning in the blood of her inner beast, she sinks into the quiet ecstasy of madness. Thanks for listening, and I hope your next session goes super well. And for Mates of the Podcast, this is Terry Robinson going, bye.